Okay, thank you very much. This will be a slightly shambolic uh, presentation of a project that is coming into uh, its closing stages. Um, earlier, I heard the first talk today, which sort of welcomed the candor with which delegates have um, addressed the conference. So in the interest of continuing that, I'd like to say this project has not been without its problems. Um, essentially, running digital humanities projects in a library, there's one major issue, which is the um, acquiring and retaining technical staff on academic pay grades. It's, it's been a massive problem for this project. It began late. It had a hiatus in the middle as we lost staff. And uh, uh, the final reporting stage is slightly delayed because our main technical officer left a month before the end of the project. Um, not out of unhappiness, um, but out of the fact that there, you know, there, are, there is better job security and uh, more money to be made elsewhere. So it's been, a, it's been a project that's had to overcome these challenges. And the results, I think, are pretty good. Um, it's really an attempt to open up the Kariganiza collection to more users. Um, there are sort of fundamental problems with using the Kariganiza collection generally if you don't read Hebrew or Arabic, and if you don't read Judeo-Arabic, which is um, the two combined, then you, you, you won't find a lot in there really to interest you initially. However, if you work on any aspect of the history of the Middle Ages, social, political, or economic, there is something in the Karaganiza that should be um, drawing your attention. What is a Geniza? I'll say a bit more in a moment about what it is, but the thing to note here is um, this is a fragment from the Geniza, um, and uh, here, that word at the top is um, the divine name, Adonai, um, the Shem Hashem, the Tetragrammaton, and if you write that on a piece of paper, a piece of parchment, or a piece of leather, that item becomes holy to the point that you can't discard it. Um, you have to treat it reverently in case somebody else abuses it to use it for magical purposes or something like that. Um, the Koganiza came to Cambridge about uh, 120 years ago. Uh, it's actually scattered around the world, but the greatest part of it ended up in Cambridge. It comes from this place, which is the Benezras Synagogue in Fustat, Old Cairo, Fustat, the original Islamic capital of Egypt, uh, when the Fatimids conquered Egypt in the 960s. Um, they created a new capital, Al Qaeda, um, and for start was sort of left to its own devices a few miles south, but in fact continued as the administrative center of, the, of this burgeoning um, Islamic empire for some, uh, for some decades, um, before eventually it was just subsumed into larger Cairo, which is why we talk about the Cairo Geniza, but I always begin with saying it doesn't come from Cairo. Um, the best definition was actually written um, by the man who found the Cairo Geniza, Solomon Schechter. Well, many people discovered the Cairo Geniza. Two Scottish ladies have a claim on it, uh, uh, sort of various other figures throughout history. But Schechter is the only one who went there, bribed the Jewish community, and brought it back to Cambridge. So he's the one we like to remember. Um, the Geniza, to explore which was the object of my late travels in the East, is an old Jewish institution. The word is derived from the Hebrew verb ganaz and signifies treasure house or finding place. When applied to books, it means much the same as burial means in the case of men. When the spirit is gone, we put the corpse out of sight to protect it from abuse. In like manner, when the writing is worn out, we hide the book to preserve it from profanation. That's the fact of the Geniza. Sacred texts are deposited reverently in this room, a storeroom of the synagogue, um, and at some point they should be buried um, properly, much the same as you would bury a person. However, for some reason, and there are various good reasons, they never got around to burying it. And the material accrued in this synagogue, the synagogue itself dates from 1040 CE, but it was built on the foundations of an earlier synagogue that dates hundreds of years before that. It accrued for a thousand years. And when Solomon Shechter arrived, the Jews of um, Fustat, of Cairo, were still using it to deposit manuscripts, and he carried away their most recent things as well as their thousand-year-old treasures. Um, he came back to Cambridge. This is what the collection looked like in 1898 in the old university library in Cambridge. Um, if you went forward about 70 years um, uh, to, to the 60s, the collection looked very similar because, <laughs> of course, Cambridge did very little with the collection. Um, Solomon Schechter was a man of great industry, but he was an outsider in Cambridge, a uh, very interesting character. He uh, took the first opportunity to leave and go to New York when it rose. Very generously, he gave the collection to the library under a few simple conditions. They appoint a librarian over it, they conserve it, and they catalog it. Um, I am the librarian. Um, however, f between about 1909 and 1969, there was no librarian. Um, and uh, we finished conserving it about 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, um, and we're still cataloging it, and we will be for another 25 years at least. 
to that end, I you know, decided we had to do something to hurry up the cataloging. We had digitized the whole collection. This is basically what it looks like in its raw state. Um, it's, it's huge. It's 200,000 fragments. But when you say that, some of the fragments are very small. Um, however, this is regarded as one item, yeah, one class mark. Um, so it is the largest medieval collection of its type. Um, it now looks like this, all nicely in Melanex. And of course, it looks superbly, you know, like an archive. It's, it's in, our, in our manuscript stacks. It's, you know, beautifully ordered. It's all there. People can order it up and look at it. But there is no catalog. There are only the sort of barest finding lists. We've cataloged about 50% of the whole collection so far. There's a summary of just a few things about it. The most interesting thing, I mean, the most important thing is that it is the best collection from the Fatimid period. Um, it's from a Jewish community that sat at the center of a large Islamic empire. Consequently, it's, um, it gives us some of the only witnesses uh, to that period um, and in great detail because it seems that the Jews of um, Fustat did not just put sacred items into it, uh, sacred texts like this. This is a holy text uh, 50 years after it was discovered by Solomon Schechter, exactly the same text which had been unknown when it was discovered turned up in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so it's a lost work of late antiquity of the Second Temple period that turns up in 10th century, 11th century Cairo, and nobody can put the two together. There's no history of transmission between the two points. That's interesting, but not so much of wide appeal to the wider sort of historical community who might be interested in the manuscripts. Things like this are far more interesting, and these are the sorts of things that I'm aiming to make more discoverable through, more discoverable through the projects. The, so this is a letter written from 1050 in Damascus, uh, some ear, there's been an insurrection against the rule in, in Syria, uh, the Fatimid rule, the benign Fatimid rule in Syria. The um, evil people of the town have risen up, taken over the town, and the first thing they've done is imposed harsh measures against the Jews. Um, and they actually write in this letter, we cut off the water supply to the Jewish community. Um, they cut it off to us, and they said, why should the Hebrews be allowed to drink from our water? So it's a primary witness of anti-Semitic abuses in 1050 in Damascus, found in Fustat because it's a letter sent all the way across, across the Fatimid Empire to seek help from the center. So the, the Geniza collects things like a honeypot of, uh, of information from across a very large and wide area. Um, and even personal items have got great historical interest. This is a letter written by father to his son-in-law. Um, it's a letter, it's sort of very polite in the Islamic world. It's written in Hebrew by a Jew to another Jew, but it's, it's in the mode of the times, which is to be ridiculously polite. So it takes a very long time to get to the point. There's a whole bit about, oh, I heard you were dead, and so I stopped writing to you, but then I heard you were alive again, so I've written you this letter. Um, and I'm informing you that your wife is in great trouble with your children. Um, you left them 23 years ago and haven't bothered to see them since. Why have you done such things to your wife and children? This is a case in Jewish law. It's a case of uh, chained women, women, uh, wid uh, women whose husbands have abandoned them but not given them a divorce deed, and so they can't get remarried. And this is exactly what's happened in this case, and this is a good example of it in practice. And the father-in-law is trying to persuade the son to come home. And he does that by saying that the Nile has flooded and is at peace. Um, which is the Nile, uh, depending on how the Nile floods, um, means whether there's famine or not in Egypt. And the price of bread is one pound for 12, um, 12 pounds for one silver coin. So it contains a number of very interesting pieces of social and economic information, which would be of great interest to people uh, who work in this period. Similarly, this is a kosher certificate to say that some cheese that's being sold by people who are not quite Jews, or not quite mainstream Jews, is still kosher for Jews to eat. Now, since 1974, there's been a research unit in Cambridge looking at this. Um, this is an entirely not posed picture. All of our offices have got black curtains all the way around them. Um, and that's what the collection looked like in the 70s. And we have been working, and most of the efforts that um, the previous research unit put into it were to conserve it. Most recently, however, we've been interested, of course, in digitization. And a few years ago, <clears throat> we got a million pounds to digitize the whole collection. And we got another million and a half to create a digital library. And the Cairo Geniza went on to it um, to a certain degree. We've got about uh, 20,000 items on there. But the, the fact is, we only put things on the digital library when we have metadata for them. And at the rate that we're producing metadata, it will be another 100 years before we get the rest of the collection online. So how do we do this in a hurry? If you look at the, uh, the description, this is behind that, it's a TEI description. So you know it's a lengthy XML piece of metadata for each item. 193,000 items there are. 
you know, 300,000 images more than. Um, so it's a considerable um, period of time that people will have to wait if they want to see something come up and be searchable on a digital library. We could put all the images up, and there are sites where you can see all the images, but you can't find anything in amongst 300,000 images if there's no data. So other institutions have uh, taken steps to see how they could do this. Princeton puts full descriptions up, transcriptions that they produce from the secondary literature, so they just have uh, graduate students copying them out of books. Um, this repeats the errors that are made in the books. Um, the Friedberg Geniza Project, which is a charitable institution um, seeking to open up the Geniza to world, um, has uh, gone through and uh, photographed our old cataloging, some of our hand lists, and reproduced, re reproduced those in an entirely non-searchable format. Again, repeating errors. This is the same letter about the man who left his wife for 23 years um, with some details entirely wrong. And they've, they've put most of their interest into matching images and using machine learning to make images uh, to match up the kind of... Uh, mosaic of images that these torn fragments have left behind. So we thought we could do something with the metadata. And one of the things, because it's been in Cambridge for 120 years, and because we've had a research unit since the 70s, we've been doing useful librarian-ish sort of things like collecting the bibliography around the collection. So we know where every item is cited in the literature. So we decided that if we could go OCR those texts, match them up with the class marks of the manuscripts, um, pull out the useful words, attach them to the manuscripts online, we could produce essentially a bag of words for each manuscript which would stand in place of um, proper, you know, formatted, structured metadata, but would still be a finding aid. Because most of the time, for items in the collection which are not online and which uh, we don't have a TEI description for, we tell people to go away and read Goitein, the great historian <coughs> of the Kyrogeniza, who is that big purple blob in the visualisation there, um, and he's the, um, the centre around which the whole Geniza universe uh, revolves here, um, who wrote five volumes of Mediterranean Society about the Kyrogeniza historical texts. We go away, and people tell them to read that and then turn to the end notes. It's got end notes, it's terrible. Find the class mark that he quotes amongst all the 20 class marks he'll quote for that page, and then go and look at the notes. That's how to do it. Could we automate that procedure and stop people having to read Goitain because that's a tremendously time-consuming experience? and just attach data to each fragment. So this is what we um, launched. We applied to the Mellon Foundation for, a, for initially a two and a half year project, which turned into a five year project uh, because of the aforementioned difficulties. However, the Mellon, uh, although they are very strict in the necessity of reporting to them appropriately and so on, have been quite understanding in the difficulties we've had. Um, and we decided that we would, um, with this approach, uh, mine as much of the secondary literature as we could but targeted upon those areas that would be most useful. So we did some, we did some um, bibliometrics around the publications from the 120 years of publications. We saw where most from that, you see that picture before, the clustering lies, so we could see there's a lot of, lot of fragments are written about by people who tend to write about magic. Um, a lot of fragments written about by people who write about economic history of the Mediterranean. So if we could find those books and just try and cover all of those subject areas, mine those texts, put the, uh, the keywords next to the fragments, we would be covering the most important, the most widely used fragments. And this is what it's ended up like. We've used um, uh, various techniques of text mining. Um, and as I say, my text miner resigned, which made writing the report at the end of the project more difficult um, than I had imagined. Um, and I would talk to you more about some of the technical nature of it, but I'm really quite ignorant of much of the detail because text mining is, is, is more art than science still. It's not a turnkey solution. There is no piece of software at the end of the day that you just pour your OCR text into. Um, we went for a long period of fine-tuning the algorithms of um, him presenting us with, uh, with information, us assessing it against the fragments, um, and, and then him adjusting the algorithm accordingly. And so what you see here is the result of quite a long sort of forwards and backwards. And these are now automatically produced from the, the long lists of words that are attacked. Like each fragment probably has three or 4,000 words associated with it from the text mind literature. Uh, it's, it's been clever. That you, when they see a class mark on a page, they attempt to put bounds around it automatically, you know, the paragraph or so on, to see and then take the words out of that. And then seeing the frequency of the words in that paragraph versus the frequency of those words across the whole book. And then those words that are more frequent in that paragraph uh, arrive bigger on this page. Yeah, so these are the words that are more significantly associated with this fragment than they are with other fragments. 
Now, it's actually not bad, because in this case, we've been able to put up a fragment entirely with the whole metadata, with some, apart from some standard sort of legal stuff and so on, the whole metadata says Geniza fragment, which describes you know, 192,999 other fragments. However, we've been able to put up the searchable word cloud, and, uh, um, which enables you to see pretty prominently marriage. And if you look at it, and anyone who sort of reads this kind of thing will see in a glance, it's a marriage deed. It's fantastic. It's a ketubah uh, from uh, 11th century first start. So it's, it's done a pretty good job in that case. Um, and because I've worked in Geniza Research for a long time, you know, it's a jealous field, lots of uh, uh, people tend to make discoveries in this large collection and then don't like to tell anyone about them. Um, and um, consequently, people are not very good about, you know, crowdsourcing would never work in a Geniza world. For a start, your constituency is too small of the people who can actually read the texts really with, um, uh, you know, the real kind of skill that's required. But also they're too jealous about the information that they would derive. Um, but what they love to do, and again, this is 20 years of experience is telling me this, is tell you when you're wrong. <laughs> Um, so to that end, we decided we would, although we have built some crowdsourcing elements into it, because we're in this for the long term, I'll say more about that in a moment, we have built in the ability for people to click on any of these and tell them they're wrong. And that then adds a negative score against that word. And if it accrues enough negative scores, it disappears down the list and it gets smaller and smaller before it disappears in a blink. Um, and so over time, these should mature and uh, get better and better as... as, as, as as some items are, uh, you know, are upvoted, uh, are not uh, downvoted, and other items therefore come to the fore. Um, and this has enabled us, for instance, to point to similar manuscripts across the, across the collection. It even starts here. It's been pointing to manuscripts in other collections, like the Michaelides collection of Islamic manuscripts and so on, which is quite cool. Um, and we built in some crowdsourcing tools because we feel uh, that if we can add to those tags, it would be great. We don't expect a lot of people to use them. It's the nature of it. It's difficult material, and people don't have much time. Um, however, we are a library that's been around with this collection for 120 years. We're a library that's been around for 600 years. If we can keep these tools alive for another 100 years, we will get some useful information from them. So we've built that in for the user-derived data. And we've built like, a cool little search thing, which I'm rather proud of. Um, where you can search across the three levels of data. So the goal, um, I don't really like the term curated metadata, but that was chosen by technical people. And of course, once they resign, it's very difficult to get your digital <laughs> services people to change anything. Um, I think I've got a ticket in to change that. Um, so, so the curated metadata is the descriptions written by the researchers, uh, uh, you know, very expensively produced uh, on soft money uh, in the Geniza Research Unit. Secondary literature is the, is the, uh, the text mined, automated data. And then the crowdsourced stuff is the stuff that's crowdsourced, which at the moment is mostly me. Um, but, it's, but it's pretty good as a result. Uh, OK, so that's just a summary. Um, Essentially, this is a solution to, to uh, uh, you know, a problem that's been around for a long time, which is you know, making a collection accessible. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a collection we've digitized, but it's still not discoverable. Even uh, you, know, you think that digitization is you know, the, the be all and end all things. Of course, it isn't. And so it was just an attempt to try and speed up the process that we've been doing for the last 100 years. Um, and the idea that any data around a manuscript is more important than no data even if it's slightly wrong or misleading, uh, over time, that should improve. Thanks very much.